Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just... So today we're talking with attorney Cynthia Bernstein Waldman. She is a alum of Tulane. She works in L.A. for um, major studios, and we talked to her about copyright and her thoughts about quilting, which she's never quilted before, so they're interesting thoughts. Um, so yeah, let's chat with Cynthia. Oh, Cynthia Burstein Waldman at Tulane Law School, New Orleans, L.A. And you are a grad. I am a grad of Tulane Law School. Right. So that's how we got to, that's how we connected because you came to an alumni event when we were in LA. Um, and you tell, tell me, do you have any memories of anyone sewing or quilting in your life when you were little? No. The only <laughs> sewing memories I can think of were my stepmom hemming my clothes because I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> and have you ever made a quilt? Never. <laughs> the only my only familiarity with quilts is using them when I was cold to warm me. Very good. So you you said to me when we got here, like, why are you interviewing me? I know nothing <laughs> about quilts, right? But we're here because you are a copyright expert, right? So tell us. Let's start. Let's start. Let's begin. So how did you get into copyright? How did that? become something were you interested in law school or did it happen later you know I was interested in law school however I had the unfortunate um situation when I was in law school of not being able to take the copyright class because it conflicted with another (laughs) class that I needed to take in order to graduate that is very funny so um in law school I only took a overview intellectual property class that um literally covered copyright in about the last two weeks of school, um, just <laughs> a mention, um, and we having spent like four months on patents. <laughs> That's because <laughs> so, the professor preferred patents to copyright. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're like a little bit like Nonetheless, that. Nonetheless, um, I uh, learned it all on the fly in my career, which basically is, um, oh, 70% practice involving copyrights. So how did you get there? How did the, So you were in law school, you didn't take the copyright class, and now you're a copyright lawyer. So how does that happen? So I moved to Los Angeles. Um, you're, and you're from here? You're from I'm New from New Orleans. Um, and I got very interested when I was in New Orleans um, with the local music industry here. And I decided that perhaps entertainment law was something that I wanted to pursue. Mm -hmm. And my initial thought was that music would be the way to go. And uh, having family and um, both parents went to college in Los Angeles and married there. I didn't know that. Yeah. And um, where'd they go in in LA? What, where did your mom went to UCLA? Dad went to SC. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. That's a crazy, that's funny. Um, so that's a big rivalry for those listening. Like that's like, you know, I don't know. Like that's funny. (laughs) So, um, they married in LA and both had relatives and friends there. I had an uncle in Los Angeles, my mother's brother who grew up here in New Orleans as well. And so, um, I had a place to stay. So when I graduated law school, I was feeling a little bit like I wanted to explore the world outside of NOLA, uh-huh. and it was um, sort of a safe way to go to go stay in my uncle's guest room, and I decided I would take the bar in California and see if I passed, and I figured I could always move back to New Orleans and take the Louisiana bar and you know live that life of practicing a lot in New Orleans, but I thought I'd give it a go. And so I moved the week after law school graduation. I got in my car just with about my this lines. time of this year, about the time of yeah. year, right? Because I yeah. just had graduation. Yeah, yeah. And then I went and um, moved into my uncle's guest room and took a bar review class with. There were several classmates who moved to LA at the same time, so we all studied together for the bar. And then I got a job clerking for a superior court judge, which is a big deal. 
That's good. And uh, then my career kind of went from that and my life and meeting my husband and... Very cool. And so uh, I don't know if you want to say, what do you do now? So I am an entertainment lawyer. I work uh, in the movie industry, as does my husband, actually, and we met through work. That's cool. That's really cool. All right. So what I want to understand, and we're going to keep like where you work, you you work at a big place that people know, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, So what we're trying to understand is the average quilter and how they should understand copyright. And so we're going to kind of talk t- about some scenarios. And I th- what I thought was uh, you in your career have had to think about other people using content owner stuff. So content owners was a content owner. So if, let's start there. So what is a content owner? Like when I say content owner, I mean like any person who owns a copyright is a content owner. Right. Do you think there's different levels of content owners? Like- Absolutely. There are people who have one copyright who might have written one book or uh, painted one painting mm-hmm. or written a poem right. or, um, you know, created a, a one single unique work of art. Or there are content owners who are libraries or motion picture studios or right. um, who own many thousands of copyrights. And so those people who are... Or, Entities, companies who own many, many copyrights, that's their business. And so they vigorously enforce their copyrights and police them. Yeah. And why? So if I. Why? Because that's how they make money. Right. (laughs) So that's super important, right? So we get this kind of interesting space. So there's people that, like, I make quilts every night. So I have a copyright in those quilts because I've kind of enough creativity, I have a copyright in it. But why does it matter kind of less? a lot less about my copyright in my ridiculous quilt and say a movie studio that makes a movie. How is that different in terms of how do we think about it if we're just like We think about person? it in terms of money and financial impact. Yeah. So you are sitting there at home and you're making a quilt and you're going to maybe put it in your daughter's bedroom for her to keep herself warm at night. No, but you're not taking money away from anybody. You're making something with your hands for your beloved child. If instead you were taking that quilt and you were then going to take it to China and you were going to reproduce um, 500,000 units and sell them at Walmart, That's bad. that would be bad because you would right. be taking a lot of money away from the company who owned the copyright in whatever material. So if you... Right. Okay. So let's let's do some scenarios. So um, I'm going to just use Star Wars because we don't aren't associated with Star Wars, right? We're, we're good, but you, we won't... Okay. So um, <laughs> we're trying to be good about our, our, our privacy stuff. Okay. So I... This is how this project began, actually. I got a really silly kit of Star Wars material, like, you know, at Joanne's or someplace. Um, and I thought my kid was going to make it. She didn't care. So, um, but then there was a PILF auction. You probably remember PILF. So, oh, right. Mm-hmm. Right? So they, public interest, um, they they raise, they have an auction, lots of drunk law students. They, they bid on stuff, ridiculous stuff that the faculty um, donates. And they then they give grants to people who are doing public interest for the for so they can cover their housing law students are doing a nonprofit so good it's a good cause so I'm like oh I know I'll make this quilt the Star Wars quilt because it's super fast it'll take me like an hour to make it two hours maybe and then they'll have something and it the, and, and Star Wars so like drunk law students will probably like a Star Wars quilt over like a fa- a flower quilt and <laughs> sure enough they did they they built a bid on it it went for a lot of money it was great. So when I went to my local quilt shop, they were like, ah, oh, you can't do that. You can't, like, sell it, right? And I was like, well, I didn't really sell it. Like, I I felt like I bought the fabric. Star Wars had licensed that fabric. They got their money out of it. They don't care if I make it for charity or not. Do you think that's true? Like, that's the first thing. Like, if I make it for my kid, that's easy. If I donate it to some place, I made one, I, I bought the kit, I made it. And I get I, get, I donated it to the law school. Is there a problem with that? Do you think? Well, I think what you say is true that you, they got their license fee from the sale of the fabric. So right. before the producer of the fabric can produce that fabric, because they're selling hundreds of thousands of, of bolts or, or right. yards, the fabric they need to go to uh, is it 
Warner Brothers, Fox. I'm not even sure who owns that. Disney, I think, now. Is right? it? I don't know. I think, because, yeah, I think that's <laughs> I don't even I know. Don't, honestly, right. don't know who owns Warner uh, uh, Star Wars. Yeah. But anyway, they need to go to the company and get a license. Right. So and that, a- that license, when they sell the fabric, they know that the fabric is going to be sold to individuals who are going to then repurpose that fabric into either clothes or quilts or other things. So there's an implied license that you're mm-hmm. going to make stuff with the fabric you're buying. I believe so. Otherwise, what's the point of buying the fabric? Totally agree. Um, and I'm not reproducing the fabric. No, you're right? making you're making a derivative work using the fabric. But I think for for there's a single use doctrine. Yeah. I believe is uh-huh. that the right terminology? Probably. I don't know. <laughs> We'll cut that part out. I don't know, but we'll double check it. Um, I know. Right, see, but, not, but there, I know there is there is a doctrine that for that's with artists, for yeah. example, or photographers, that when they create a work and they sell it, yeah. they retain the copyright right. in the in the um, image. Right. But the person. So, if you were at a charity auction, yeah. and you bought a photograph. Um, and then you decided to donate that photograph to another charity auction. It, there's a single, there's an exception, a single right. use exception. That's interesting. I'm yeah. not, not. We'll double check. Yeah, it's not yeah. my, not my area. area. Okay, but I know so. that with art, that, right. I mean, there's a difference in selling the actual painting because like paintings, right, go paintings through all. Sold, right. First, right. That's um, the but. You couldn't take that painting and then turn it into another. You can't put it on T-shirts. You can't right. like, copy the right, painting right, 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 because exactly. that's a copyright part. Right. Okay. So in our scenario, I bought fabric that was properly licensed fabric, and I made something and I donated it. Everybody's okay with that. That's not a big deal. Let's say I take, I find a bunch of these kits or a bunch of fabric, and I ever it was a big hit. Let's pretend it was a big hit, and now I make same fabric. I bought it. I now make five of them, and I'm selling them on Etsy. How do you feel about that? I still purchase the fabric. Right. It's the more, the closer you get to being like a sale in commerce, the more troublesome it becomes and the more um, problematic it might be. Although, until you actually get a cease and desist letter. Right. Okay, so let's think about that part. So... Let's say, do you have a sense of how the big players, like, I know they're not going to tell us that, but sort of at what point should our quilters be worried? So that's the question is like, they don't have any sense of like, they don't want to be in trouble, right? Sure. And so the question is, if they have, the ones I get all the time are the licensed saint material, right? So that saints, the saints have fabric. Oh, who that? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is like, well, what can I do with it? Am I like, is, are there restrictions? Can you put restrictions on objects? Like for sale doctrine, can we just like make whatever we want to make with it? Or we don't know. What, what should we be asking other people? You don't the NF- Let's talk about fan fiction so and fan art because this is where really it all happened, right? So I remember, and you probably – were you working in the industry before fan fiction? Yes. Actually, I mean I have definitely seen a trend um, shift yeah, whereas – trying to understand. Yes, and there definitely has been. I think at the b- beginning um, – when anybody, fans, or anyone in, at, at all would use a work that they didn't have rights to, the copyright owners would send cease and desist letters right away as soon as they, they what, got wind of it. What era? What what time period are we talking I feel about? like... Because um, we're recording, we're going to preserve these for... Right. Someone might be listening. Um, probably up until, I don't know, the early 2000s or maybe even right. the later 2000s. Yeah, because we have like, like we had a conference here on user-generated culture in like 2005, 2006, and everybody was still like, what is this? Should we be concerned? Like people are freaking out. Yes, and right? I think that there was, there was a lot of um, concern. But I think 
at a certain point, um, it kind of got more to the realization, like, we can't beat them, so let's join them. Right. So what, so this is really interesting flip, right? I, this is what's so, yeah, cool. no, I think it, right? it I think so because about that. Flip. Well, I think what happened is I think there was a realization that, um, these are our fans that we're alienating. Right. And so these people are trying to show their appreciation and love for our properties. And so when we send them a cease and desist letter, it's like a slap in the face. Right. And then they don't like us anymore. Right. Like your super fans, the fans that love your stuff so much, they want them like post pictures and make 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 the art about it. Um, you're like, yeah, you can't do that. Right. And so, I mean, at the, then you're alienating your fan base, right. which is really not what you want to do. I mean, you want to be able to preserve the fan base and grow them so right. that they continue to come see your movies or right. buy your books or your T-shirts or whatever it is. And so if you anger them um, by smacking their hand, then that's not going to happen. So I think it, it, there was a realization that we're being short-sighted by sending these little cease and desist letters. And instead, we should embrace... And and support and then you know and then it's ultimately going to enhance our brand and not detract from it. Right. So it's really so fascinating to watch, like the last ten years that shift and then the embracing of, like. So give me an example of like what. Give me an example of like sort of the current culture. What that means exactly. Well, I for example, I have a friend who um, is was a creator of a um, web series uh, and he had someone send him on on Twitter like a picture of something related honestly and I know it's not a good example because I really don't remember exactly what it was <laughs> but he retweeted it and he was you know excited about it yeah. instead of saying oh no we have to shut these people down I'm trying I mean I, let's like YouTube um, so like when a movie comes out, fan. like Black Panther just came out, other things, fans will dress as the, the right. and they'll make art about it. They write stories. They make the, whatever the, like the cool scarf, like there's all this stuff happening. How concerned should we, cosplay is vibrant. Like fan art is vibrant. They're not getting I think that, success let, letters in that same right. way. I mean, again, I think it's, it, it all comes down to the mighty dollar. Yeah. And and if you're showing appreciation and excitement for the product, if there's yeah. a movie premiere and or coming out and you go to the first showing and you're wearing costumes yeah. and, um, you know, or you um, have a little magazine about it that you share amongst your friends, I think that that... As long as you're not selling it. Right. So they were doing, a, so this behavior was always happening, love of stuff, but the internet changed it because then they posted it online. And then the question was like, can you do that? Can you not do that? And it seems like the, what we see with like the Star Trek stuff and other spaces, and the Star the, the so the case where they made it, they raised money on uh, Kickstarter and they raised a million dollars and they were making their own version of Star Trek and then... CBS and Paramount sued them, yeah. um, and they settled. I mean, there was a court case, but they settled. And one of the settlement was like, as long as it, you don't have a budget over fifty thousand dollars, and a whole bunch of other restrictions. But that tells you kind of where the economics are for the movie studios. They're not super. This is my theory. I don't work for them <laughs> at all. But this is what I'm seeing: is that it's not worth it economically to go after, you know, someone making, I don't know. Skylander hats and selling five of them on Etsy. That's not, it's not worth the time to do it. If they're making $50,000 on Etsy hats, that might be different. But I don't know. Is it different? Each, I imagine each studio, each content holder has a different approach. Like it's not like flat across it, but it's just economically really hard, right? So I guess the question is what, any advice on that? Any thoughts about that? I, I, I think know. that if it feels wrong to you, that you probably shouldn't do it. I mean, yeah, I think that's a really good. So, give me an example of what would feel wrong. If you feel that you're using it in commerce and you're doing something that's going to take money away from the copyright holder, don't do it. Don't do it. We feel that way about patterns too. So, people, the pattern makers are the are the. I feel the hardest for them because it's it's. So this patterns came in today, right? So it took a lot to make this, and she'll sell this. It's in England, so for like six pounds. But like you could photocopy it very easily, right? They're they're ha- they're struggling the most because it's so easy. It's like you know, it's so easy to make a copy of it, um, and yet that six dollars 
per pattern, they need to sell a lot of them. So we try to, at least for this project, try to encourage people not to, not to rip off the pattern makers because they're working hard. Um, they're just trying to. Well, I mean, I think we, I mean, let's just say, well, I don't think anybody should rip off anybody for anything, right? You know what I mean? I'm just like. This is so easy. So, mm-hmm. so here's my thought. Some of this is super easy. Like, I think about the, the sound recordings. Making a copy of a song, super easy. Mm-hmm. But the, the sound, the music industry has sort of focused more on concerts, things that, like, are... Well, that's right? out of necessity. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure that, that... I mean, I think in order that, to survive... Exactly. Yeah. So then we get to see in the quilting industry, also there's all these consumables. Mm-hmm. So you have to buy... You have to keep buying it to do whatever it is. They're in a better mm-hmm. space than, say, the pattern makers where mm-hmm. you can easily copy it. Right. So... So yeah, what doing what's right in each industry. So best practices come into play, right? So that best practices. So certain industries have certain ways that are, what what is cool and not cool, even if the law is a little bit different. And it seems like with best practices, with you should just respect the pattern makers. If you're going to use their pattern, buy it. Well, why don't you? Well, you could look at it this way. What if it were you? What if you had created the pattern That's yourself? Right. That's right. Or what if you know somebody that you knew had spent all this time to create something, and then someone else okay. said, "Oh, well, I could just do that. I don't need to pay the six dollars." Right. So I mean, here's, then <laughs> here's the problem, Cynthia. So this is what this pattern is. So this is um, uh, this is from the Crafty Nomad we're looking at. And so what you have to do is you have to photocopy these. So they're giving us permission to photocopy these. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but this is just a shape, right? right? So there's not super protectable, right? It's great. And she made something really cool and it's super great. But when you come down to sort of the level of protection of copyright, other people have made this shape. It's not like original in that sense. No, but this, but is, all this, is. To, this is a combination of colors Something. and the way that That's they're... Right. They're arranged, arranged that's right. and then the stitching in the that's middle. Right. So then people sort of start to feel like, well, I can just photocopy this because why would I buy this? And so you get this kind of – so you have to sort of stop yourself and say, okay, yes, but she she put the time into it to make it and that you have to sort of respect the time. Like I think the film industry had the same problem, right, with copying movies. It's super easy to make copy. That's a really good example, right? Super easy to make a copy of a movie. Really hard to make a movie. Really hard and not and mon- many, many, many millions of dollars. Right. This is the same kind, right? <laughs> super hard to make the pattern. Super easy to copy the pattern. Super hard to make the pattern. Super easy to make it. And so I'm trying to understand for people in, I think the film industry and the video game industry really lead us in terms of how we think about copyright at this. Like those two, we did a video game, we wrote a video game book um, a couple of years ago, Ron and I did. And so it was really interesting to sort of see these industries, sort of how you remake yourself, how you get people to understand, stop making copies of our films illegally. Um, and I know we have a joke at our house. I don't know, not really a joke, but every time we watch a movie, you know, there's a big warning that says copyright uh, infringement or pirate is a piracy is yeah. not a victimless crime. Yeah. And so, but every time we see it, I actually stop and I have a teenager mm-hmm. as do you. And I say to my child, piracy is not a victimless crime and you are a victim. <laughs> that's right. Cause you're I said, family. you see that's those, right. I said, you see those shoes that's on right. your feet. That's right. Those are paid for because of the copyrights that the company that I work that's for right. owns. And that's what we see with the, with quilting too. They say like, this is how we pay our rent. This is how we exactly. Well, that's money. it. And I mean, these the content owners and the content producers um, get their bread and butter by the work that they put into their copyrights. And yeah. if you, you know, were to go on the internet and download the copy of, um, you know, Black Panther versus going to the movie theater and paying to see it. Um, you are taking money out of the mouths of hundreds of people, maybe thousands, actually, because it's not only the actors and the producers and the directors, there's the lighting people and the set dressing people. And the lawyers and the and, the, and then, well, right, but we haven't even gotten to them yet yeah. because until then there's the post-production people oh, right. and the post-production houses and um, then 
you know, the technical people, then you get to the, the studio and the distribution arm, and then there's the overhead of the company itself and all the people who work in accounting and legal and marketing. And um, there's a lot of people's families who are being supported by, um, you know, the industry. And so you're not thinking about that when you're like, oh, I just don't want to pay 10 or $15 or $20 or whatever it is to go to the movies. So I'm just, of course you could, and not to mention the viruses and whatever you might be downloading to your computer. But I mean, it really has like a vast impact. And, um, you know, the way our system is set up is the copyright system, the copyright system and just in, in our financial system, I mean, our, our whole, economics, dem- our whole right, our everything, consumerist, cult, capitalist, society. exactly the capitalist system. Right. That's how it works. Right. Um, and so, I mean, honestly, there's not that much, there's not any difference conceptually really between downloading that um, movie f- um, from the internet and walking into a convenience store and walking out with, you know, all of the, um, you know, the food or whatever. I mean, you're walking out with a gun or, right. to, you know, right. it's, it's really the same thing. It's yeah. just, it somehow doesn't seem as bad when you're doing it right. because you're not like walking in somewhere and holding it up, but yeah. because they're kind of nameless and faceless, the right. victims, but. All right. Well, I think that's super interesting. And let me ask you, let's shift gears a little bit more on copyright. So sometimes people want to be like, um, I want to put, I'm trying to put in things like, I know that you won't have to, won't put you in a comfortable position because the one that I get is one that is in your world. Um, let's stay with Star Wars. Um, I, so the big thing right now that's going around, this is very funny. So um, they have Darth Vader. It's all over the place. Darth Vader, and it says press to the dark side. Because when you press your seams, you press it to, if you have two fabrics, you press it to the dark side. So it's Darth Vader, and it says press press to the dark side. So they've not gotten permission from the Star Wars. It's all over the place, right? Like, it, like everybody has their own version of it. It's very funny. It's very silly. It's very funny to think of Darth Vader quilting, right, and telling people to press to the dark side. Um, what is that? Is that fair use? Is that... Permit, you know, is that just uses that people? Is it? Was how it, do we understand that? Is it thing? a saying? Is it a saying? Is it a, like a thing? It's I like mean, a picture of Darth Vader, and oh, then just says "press to the dark, press to the dark side." It's always got Darth Vader in this very Darth Vadery thing. Like they've all made their own version of Darth Vader, and then they put in like "press to the dark side." Now, thoughts about that? Like, is that is that just weird culture that like is under the under underground? Like should well, Star I don't know. Wars doesn't, be mad? Again, doesn't seem like anything's being sold, is it? No, is it but like they just like a, a little pattern. reminder. Maybe what if somebody made a pattern of a quilt that said that used used it? I think again, it's the use in commerce yeah. when you start, and it's something that maybe the Star Wars franchise at Disney would want to license, right? They may want to make their own press to the dark side um, thing. Okay, so the other thing I get is, oh, I want to put a. Um, I love Gone with the Wind, or I'm trying to figure out some old movie, and they want to make their own version, or they want to. The other one I get is lyrics. They want to take lyrics from a song, and they want to put it on a quilt. I think we do the same analysis, right? Are you selling? Is it for your personal use? Are you selling it? How many are you selling? Is it going to affect commerce? Like, and then the question then is, what if I do want to sell? I want to make. A thousand pressed to the dark side, and I want to sell it. I think it's going to be awesome. I want to make T-shirts that say that. What do I do if I want to do that? Can you get a license from? You can't really get a license, right? From you're too small. Can you? Like, is there a way? I don't, like, I, I don't know. I cannot speak to you, you know, know what 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 another you know. Uh, yeah. But in right. general, I don't know. Like, do we have mechanisms in place? I think for, that it is difficult to you know for a small person to get the attention of a big company. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a risk. I think it's a risk. And I think that every person has to, you know, come to a resolution. It's a legal of risk. risk of whether. So let's say I didn't make my T-shirts. I made my T-shirts and I sold them at quilt shows. And then I suddenly I got I started selling a lot of them at quilt shows. And then suddenly somebody sent me a cease and desist letter. What is that? It's a letter that says, hey, you. Stop! You don't have the right to sell that. You're you're selling a copyrighted work, and you don't own the copyright. Um, if 
you should stop or we're going to take further legal action against you. And when you get a cease and desist letter, are they also telling you you have to pay money to them? Or is I there think any kind of- generally the process is like stop. And if you stop, you'll probably be out of trouble. Okay. So probably. Depending on like what you've been doing, right? Like right. If you're, like, that's interesting. So that's the fear is a cease and desist letter that you're going to, you're going to be. So if you get a letter, let's say you pro you produce those shirts and you get a letter and you stop, you should stop. So you may then be sitting with a garage full of shirts that you're going to have to burn or something or destroy them. Right. Yeah. And that you will have lost the money. Yeah. And um, you're going to have to find a way to dispose of them. And you're probably going to have to agree with the copyright owner how to dispose of them. Yeah. And um, it's a risk that you're going to take. It's really interesting. Now, does your business, your office, like your practice, do you um, ever come across sort of these kinds of licensing deals with fabric companies? Or that's a whole different that's like, a, space. That's like, like a special like area within the companies. Yeah, we had interviewed, I have to interview him again, um, Matt Skelton, who's at Microsoft, and he was doing the... Um, he was in the group. He didn't do the Minecraft one, but he was. They just bought Minecraft when we were, had interviewed him. Can you imagine? And then all the licensing deals for Call of Duty and these other spaces. And he's like, his whole job was the licensing aspect, like like they like all the video games and sort of how they and, and sort of. I don't think people realize how much is going into like any one movie or any one thing. That there's just tons. That is the value. The Keeping the copyright holder has the right to license stuff, and that, so making those well, so every copyright is like a bundle of sticks, right? Yeah, and so every license is like one of those sticks. So if you picture like a big, um, you know, group of let's say 200 matches, like with a rubber band together yeah. in your hand, yeah. and then every copyright license you give one of those sticks. To a different person, but like there, I mean, there could be an infinite number of sticks. Yeah. Depending on how many you ways you want to, right? Ways. You can carve yeah. it up into many yeah. different ways, and people might want to make clothing. Other people might want to make posters. Some people might want to make quilts and fabric. Some people might want to make stickers. Right. I mean, and so however many ways people can devise to, um, Repurpose. All right. So I have two more questions, and then we're going to ask. I'll ask my final question, and we'll be done. Etsy. How does the content owners? How does LA feel about Etsy? Is it just annoying? Is it? Have they made their peace? I don't know. I don't really know. I mean, I have personally used Etsy for Uh my. I mean, I like Uh kind of um, you know handmade, cool Uh crafts, Uh and um, I like them for myself. So I have bought things on Etsy. You, Although I don't believe I have ever bought a copyrighted thing on Etsy, I bought right. So what about trademarks? So we haven't we've talked about copyright, but trademarks is a big thing too. All the copyrightable character, I mean the trademark characters, names of things. Etsy's full of stuff like people using other people's trademark to make stuff. Does that um, any worries about that? Should we? If people are out there like I want to make Coca Cola pillows or whatever, thoughts about that? I mean, I kind of think it all comes down to the same almighty thing. dollar. It's the right. same analysis. Now, how you is know? it different? I mean, although, I don't know. I'm not not being a co- trademark I lawyer. Know. How is copyright <laughs> different if it's, I'm thinking about the appropriation art, the collage art, where you're taking bits and pieces of things. How does that fit into this ecosystem? Well, a trademark has a concept called dilution, right, which right. is different than copyright. Right. And so I actually don't, I mean, I don't know right. how... That enters into the analysis. Right. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll be looking at that too. So. But there, I mean, they definitely. I mean, so right. with trademark dilution, the more somebody uses your um, trademark, um, the less value that it has. If mm-hmm. like it, you know, it's it's like being watered down and yeah. it's not standing for what it's supposed to be standing for. So, so I don't know. I'm not really sure whether fan art yeah. and fan, you know, things could uh, it poses a risk of dilution. That's really interesting. Okay, so I was talking to somebody else. A uh, law professor, or a librarian law person. And she said that she felt that there was a difference between a physical pattern and a downloadable pattern in terms of the restrictions you can put on it. So what we find is that when people are doing these patterns, like this one's a pretty gentle one. This one just says all rights reserved. But sometimes they say like, you can't make more than five copies of this or you can use it, but you can't Mm -hmm. give it to your friends. Mm -hmm. Like they do all these weird restrictions. 
And my question was first sale doctrine. Like at what point is like the difference between like your derivative right versus your first versus first sale doctrine? I don't know when one begins and one ends. So, well, what about it, it's pretty similar to buying a um, record album or a CD. Um, tell I mean, me how? Oh, well, so when you get a CD, like it's for your use, your family use. Like, I mean, you can use it. You can give it to your kid and go, hey. Yeah. Listen to this. So maybe it's like a license to your family or sort of the same, like when you're downloading movies or music um, on your Netflix or whatever. Right. But then if you're like, hey, um, I'm going to have a party. Come on over. I'm going to have 25 people now coming to watch my single copy. Then now it looks like you're starting to take money away from the copyright holder. Or if you lend your CD to your friend who, instead of buying it himself, makes a copy of it. He or just makes a copy or, or just watches it. Yeah. And then, so instead of the money that maybe he would have paid through iTunes or through buying a physical copy of the CD, now he's just like listening to yours. And so that's money okay, so out wait, of the copy. So let me, let's back up because I think that. I I'm, I won't go that far. So let's talk about this. And copyright people always think that's kind of the joy of copyright. So it seems like when I that we have some, it seems like software we can't lend out software because it's a license. It's not a sale, right? And digital copies might be the same way that they're licensed. They're not sales, right? And so we can't. Although there's lending now on digital lending and all that weirdness, but if I have a book. I can lend that book to somebody, right? I can like say, hey, I'll, you should read this book. I bought the book mm -hmm. and I can lend it and I can sell it. I can sell it to a used bookstore. I can rip it up. I can do, it's my object. I can do with it what I want. Would you yeah. start with that premise? Same with this pattern, right? This is like a book. I can. It is, although you're saying like there's copies and then there's downloadable copies. And so suddenly now it's, if you say, well, you can download it, now it's accessible to millions of people. Yeah, I just, we just photocopied it. So just, it's just in the back of the book. We just photocopied it. See, it says, tells me to photocopy it. But it seems like this book is like a book. Is there any difference with this book? And I, this is not like you, you're not an attorney here. We're just like talking about copyright. So it seems like this to me. I don't know what kind of, so this, then I get, so I see, okay, I can do whatever I want with this because it's like a book, but it's not like a book because it's teaching me how to make something and that has a copyright on it. So then the question is, that's what you were telling me. The reason, but we your hypo started with like a restriction in the back right. that you and can only give to Can five you put people. restrictions on it? So a movie, a CD of a movie, I buy the movie. I can sell that movie to a used bookstore. Same thing as a book, mm -hmm. right? Now, the question of public performance, right, that's different than the object, right? So yeah. I can't, I think. So then, but let's say I want to make this, and I, it's your thing. I say, hey, China, I want you to make this thing. And I, I, I distribute it. I, I, find a, I find somebody in China, and they make this pattern. That is clearly not cool. But I don't know why it's not cool, like legally. Like, what's keeping it? Is it the, what is it? And I don't know. And so some people say, this is, I don't necessarily agree with what Brandy said. She says, if it's physical, this booklet, we can't put any restrictions on it because of first sale doctrine. But if the pattern is digital, then you can put as many restrictions as you want. But that seems like a really stupid result. But I don't know. It's not just a book. It also has like... You know, parts. things you do, but that's not protectable, right? No, but like you were saying, like the work and the, the arrangement is protectable in yeah. a way that it, it um, right? it's presented. Isn't that and weird? So it's like, I, I struggle. The book. I'm not there yet. I don't really know what to say. Because on the one hand, I feel like you can do whatever you want with this pattern. I cannot make copies of it and be a market replacement. I can't make copies for 100 people. But it's like it. you're diluting it. I don't know. It's sort of the same thing. It's like you're taking it and you're parsing it apart and then you're like selling parts of it. Yeah. As opposed to the whole thing in the book where like it's all together. You think here. that I shouldn't be able to say I'm done with this and because like guilds, they people bring their old magazines and their old books and stuff and you can make a choice of like people. There is a resale, like there's a not even a resale, just giving away market. Like, I'm not going to use this. Do you want to use it? 
Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess I don't with know. the single thing, I don't know. I mean, it's You're like, back to the single use thing. It doesn't I mean, like really my, matter. My kid had a study guide that he got for AP Bio. Right. Tell me about that. Of, so uh, one of his friends who's a great older used it last year. Right. Um, and then she took the class and she was done. She didn't need and it. She didn't need it anymore. So she's like, here, you're taking AP Bio next year. Take this book. Yeah. And so, you think that's okay? Um, and I think that was okay. Yeah. Um, because that's what we say with first sale doctrine, which mm-hmm. says I bought it, I can do with it what I want to do with it, not with digital copies, but with right now. If that same girl, instead of giving my son the one book, said, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm done with it, but I'm going to upload it now so that everyone who's or here's taking, my password right, well, and right. here's everybody who's taking AP right. Bio next year can use my book for free." Now that's not okay, and I think that the people can. I think that makes sense. I mean, I think that, I mean, I think it's back to what you think, what you were talking about is like, like check the pocketbook. Like, is it like now granted you're still losing the sale when you give your son the book, but that's just part of our world, which is the first sale doctrine. So you're not going to get every sale. You're not going to be like every, I mean, well, so, also the know. other thing though is like, so another friend who had a child who was a couple years older had previously cleaned out her house and given me a stack of study guides and, you know, books. And it turned out that when he was studying, I'm like, oh, you know, I think Sherry gave us another AP book. Let me go down. And uh, sure enough, there was another AP bio guide, and it was exactly the same book, but it was one edition earlier. Interesting. And so I say to him, there oh, you go. That's look, the whole we have point, two. Right? So now I say, oh, well, look, we have another one, but the one, I said, which edition do you have right. from your friend last year? He says, it's the fifth edition. I said, oh, this is the fourth. Right. So then I say, you know what? I'm just going to throw away the fourth because and that's the whole point, right? Because it's the consumable thing mm-hmm. that because if you have each edition, right. then you want to buy the new one, right. then they're not worried about the secondary market of the sales. So that's sort of, again, sort of how to get around, like it's a, that's why the book, that's why all fourth, fifth, sixth, like that's what we do with law students, right? We make them buy the new one every year. Well, right. And, and, and right? The, the material that you teach in your copyright class now yeah is different than the material that I would have learned had I been able to take Cindy Samuel's (laughs) copyright class because of my (laughs) schedule. I can't believe that. That's like the funniest story, right? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. So we're almost, we've been having a good chat. So people are going to listen to this and they're going to freak out a little bit because they're going to be like, I'm still confused. And we're writing a little book that's going to make it easier. And this is really sort of thinking through these questions. I think what we're hearing and what you're saying is look to the economics. When does it matter? Who is it going to hurt? Like if you're going to do it, who are you hurting? And are you hurting somebody? Is that kind of the way to I think, think about yes. it? I think, yes. I think that is definitely the way to think about it is, use, is who are you hurting and think about who made this, what type of work it took to make that, what, yeah. how much effort went into it, and are you taking money out of their pocket? And then if you are, I think there's still two more questions to ask, which is how much money are you taking out of their pocket? Are they going to, is it going to matter to them? Like if you're selling, if somebody wants you to make a quilt for them and they're going to pay you to make it because they liked your kid's quilt, nobody's going to care. But if you're selling it or you're sending it to China or you're making significant money off of it, there may be a big problem. So I think that's the first thing. Like somebody was like, I can't have somebody make the Mickey Mouse pattern on my quilt because they might get in trouble. And it's like, I don't think Disney cares whether you make two circles and a bigger circle sewing it on a machine. Like, like you're not even like, like you're, I mean, maybe they do care. We'll ask them. But that seems like really hard to police. And that's the thing is there isn't... Well, they can't... I mean, currently today, nobody can just walk into your home and take a look around for your... Copyright Your your, your copyright. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) Things could change. Oh, my gosh. Um, Can you imagine? We don't have copyright police, though, right? There's no such thing. No. And so it has to come to someone's attention. Right. I mean, it won't... Just by virtue of happening, currently... There's no way that someone's going to know about it. If you're, as you're sewing, there isn't some bell that goes off. Ding, 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 ding. No, you're venturing out of, out of the safe zone. Exactly. Um, so, you know, it would have to come to the attention of the copyright owner. And if you're doing it um, for your own personal enjoyment, that's probably not going to happen. All right. I have two more things to ta- ask you and then we're done. I, I keep saying that, but, th- but they keep coming up. So the other thing that happens is people make quilts for quilt shows. 
So I make a quilt for a quilt show and it's publicly displayed. Does that shift it? Like if I say I make my Star Wars version of whatever, since we've been using Star Wars, should I worry about it now being publicly? Does it shift it by just publicly well, I think if it's on it? display, it's still one copy. I agree. What if it, there's prize money involved? Does that change it? I don't think it does. No, because I think, I mean, it was the, it's the craftsmanship that yeah. you put into making the I totally item. Agree. And I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll ask more content holders because I'm, I don't, I don't want to lead people astray in sort of my vision of the world and it's my own weird little vision of what the world is in my little teeny tiny office. But, um, okay. And then I guess the last question is how worried about copyright should people be on a daily basis? Cause there's a lot of weirdness out there. There's a lot of people claim like telling me, you know, There's a lot of people saying stuff about it. How important, like in a regular person like me. (laughs) You're a regular person like me who's a copyright professor at a law school. He has podcasting, does a lot of weird stuff. Okay, but (laughs) my regular hat, like I don't think that, I think that most of the time copyright, like we're good citizens, we buy movies, we go to movies, we buy Sure, I think mostly that's true. I think, yes, I think that's true. I think the average person probably is not going to get into trouble With copyright. I mean, I think generally the people who get into trouble know that they're doing things that are probably, you know, not cool. Right. I think so too. I think we just get trapped. Some of the, I mean, well, I think the you know, people like, who are good people who want to do right, who don't want to break the law, um, tend to be very conscientious. And um, if they or have a concern, they're sort of hyper concerned. Yeah, and I'm worried that sometimes they go too far. Like they that you know it is it's part of the creative process. Like you should be able to like express. It's the whole thing of the fans again, right? It's okay to make a Skylander hat for your kid because they love Skylanders. Don't be stressed about it. You know, like, um, it may not be okay to sell a lot of those on Well, yeah, you know, my son, when he was little, loved Pokemon. Yeah. Love, love, love Pokemon. So we spent several days where we would trace the Pokemon and we cut them out and we colored them and we laminated them and we hung them up around his room. That's so cool. And we, you know, and we, he knew all the names and right. who they, who they evolved into right. and the whole thing. And so, you know, we did art projects. It was awesome. Oh, we also, he did, we did rock painting once. He had to do a school project and we had, he had to do a how to book and we had to do, um, so he chose a book about how to paint a rock yeah. and we went through a whole process of choosing a rock and we wound up, he painted some stuff. I painted at, in along with him, a two lane rock. Cool. With, with the, the green, with the two lane logo <laughs> and a new Orleans saints, um, rock with a fleur de lis symbol. And how'd you feel about that? Were you cool with that? I love them and they sit on my desk and I proudly display them in my office and I use them to hold open books on my desk. I love it. And your copyright lawyer who's got a pretty serious job. So you're okay with that. So I'm okay with that because I'm a Tulane and New Orleans Saint fan and I use my own hand to try to create their logos and I'm not selling it to anyone. Yeah. And it was a fun day that I spent with my child and so I think about it fondly while I look at my rocks. That's right. And that's really the that that's it, right? That that's really cool. Well, Cynthia, I am so psyched that you are willing to come and play with us and talk about this. This is all super important. I think it's a mindset. I think the more that people hear about it and talk, and there's lots of people saying the same kind of thing, um, that you start to understand the physics of this world, um, and then you'll be less scared, that you kind of get sort of what it is. It's just kind of foreign to people, sort of how copyright works. So thank you. Anything else before we end? No, thank you for having me. And I look forward to being... Bundling up in the cold with some some quilts from your listener. Totally. All right. Fabulous. Take care. So this is Elizabeth Townsend Guard. You've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. We want to hear from you. Join our army, our quilting army. Go to our Facebook page. Suggest people to be interviewed. Suggest yourself to be interviewed. We are excited to hear from you. But most importantly, I hope you get a chance to quilt today.